The Sandy and Todd Cast is a Mind Garden Media podcast in association with Screw You Todd Productions. As with everything we do, our original plans for the season <laughs> went off track, and now it's all about questions and answers. And actually, we're having a lot of fun with this. We are, and it's so funny. I knew you were going to say that, so I was prepared to just start cracking up. Yes, yes, as usual, plans go all over the place. And here we are doing Q&A for the season, which has been a ton of fun, Ted. Yep, and we've got more questions to answer. Uh, it's Season 7, Episode 2, Q&A with s and Part 2. It's next on the Sandy and Todd cast. We make podcasting easy. Mind Garden Media can get you going on your very own podcast. With many years in the broadcast and audio industry, Mind Garden Media can edit fully produce and provide all the web distribution services. We're podcasters too, so we'll guide you every step of the way to a professional sounding podcast production. For information, email the Mind Garden Media at gmail.com. The Mind Garden Media at gmail.com. Or check us out on Facebook. Broadcasting from two very different yet magical places not found on any map. Get ready to discuss the strange, weird, ghostly, crazy, spooky, and odd things that take place around us each and every day. All while having a little bit of fun. This is the Sandy and Todd Cast. Welcome to another Sandy and Todd cast. She is Sandy. He is Todd. And it's another round of questions and answers with the goofballs, basically. Basically. And let me just put the disclaimer out that, you know, we're not going to know the actual answer. Like, this is really based on our own personal experiences and thoughts. Right. It's our thought process. It's not set in stone someplace in the paranormal world where tablets have been made by the paranormal (laughs) gods. And, you know, somebody came down from the second floor carrying them. And then there was a burning bush. I mean, we just that's not what this is about. No, this is just kind of what we think it is. And we were saying before we started recording today how, We love that people relate to us so much and how cool it is that they trust us. Like you guys really trust us enough to ask us these questions. But also realize that our answers are just, you know, what we kind of think. And I had a really nice message from uh, Kyle. We did his message last week and his was the real deep motherfucker about like, you know, and and we both basically said, you know, we we don't have the answer. (laughs) Um, we don't know. This is what we think. But thanks maybe. for the tough questions. I appreciate yeah. that. I know. I like the tough questions because they really make you think a little bit and draw from your own experiences. Like, seriously, I look at it as you and I have had so many different experiences with things in the spiritual, paranormal realm, pers- real, true personal experiences that it kind of has shaped the way we think and feel. So it, it it's really interesting. And, and the fact that people will write to us afterwards or comment and say, yeah, you know, I kind of thought that, too. And I had this experience one time. And that kind of makes me realize that what you're saying, you know, is a possibility. I love that. I love that everybody relates to the things that we say and think and, you know, and and we respect the people can't relate to us and who have their own opinions because that's how you learn is by opening yourself up to different experiences and different opinions and thoughts. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say to to respond to that. (laughs) I can see it in your face. So for everybody who doesn't know when we, when we record, it's not like just, you know, we don't see each other. So it's all video sort of like our live casts are. And so I can see when I'm talking what his response is usually going to be. Or if I totally zoned out and have no idea what you're talking about anymore, (laughs) you know? So that I saw that one coming. Yeah. All right. So let's start with the questions and we may be going out of order a little bit. I'm kind of lumping some of the questions together 
for one episode and then we'll lump some more. There's one that I got about purgatory, believe it or not. And it's an excellent question, but I have to think more on like it's going to be sort of a Kyle type question. So I really want to think on it a little bit more. So that's probably going to be in next week's episode. So let's kick it off with Lorna, because Lorna had one of the best questions that I've seen. And it's also something that I truly probably know not that much about. But we'll see what you think, Todd. All right. So Lorna says, what are your thoughts about the experience between death and spirit? Have you ever connected with anyone who has given an account of their experience? You know, so are are we asking like if somebody who says they've died and come back to life kind of thing? Is that what we're asking about? My take on it is that Lorna, like, because you know that I connect with people so I can connect, especially like if I'm in a a place, uh, well, as empaths, I guess, too, both of us as empaths. But I also have connected with spirits or energies in investigations, in my travels, where I've actually picked up thoughts and feelings and emotions from them. It's, you know, it's not just names for me and stuff like that. It's like I actually sometimes I hate to say it like this, but kind of become the person in a way because I take on their emotions and thoughts. So I kind of took it as have have we ever connected with someone on the other side who was able to communicate that with us. And I can't say that I specifically have communicated with anyone who has said to me, okay, this is what it's like where I am. But I have had some experiences where I've picked up on what these intelligent spirits or energies have conveyed to me through their thoughts and feelings and emotions. One example I'll give was an invest at Sylvan Beach, New York. I did it for one uh, the season of the ghost show, Ghost Pubs and Grubs, that I did. And I was with Susie from, among everybody else, the whole cast, I was with Susie from Apps. And I didn't belong to Apps at the time, but it was an old sanatorium uh, from the turn of the century, um, early 1900s. And I connected with the wife of the doctor who owned and ran the sanatorium, Dr. Kavanaugh. And I connected with his wife. Now, they had a two, they had two children and they had a 17 year old son who died. And of course, the sanitarium, sanatorium back at the turn of the century, there was a lot of illnesses that today either don't exist anymore or are well controlled. And their son actually at the age of 17 died from the same one of the same diseases that they fought to help people be cured by cured from at the turn of the century when the sanitarium was open. And when I connected with her, I just felt this incredible sadness and guilt. And what I got from it, I literally had a conversation with this woman through my, through my head. And what I learned from her was that on the other side She was still, and this is probably the reason why she was still there, she was so racked by guilt because the thing that she and her husband worked so hard to cure people from was the thing that they couldn't cure their own son from, and as a result, he died from it. And so she had this incredible sadness and guilt of being someone who couldn't even help her own son. And It sort of gave me a look into what does kind of go on on the other side when spirit, when energy is still in the place where they spend a lot of time or they're tied. They feel themselves tied. I don't like we said last week, I don't necessarily think that any spirit is bound, like physically bound to a location. I think that sometimes they may think they are because that's where their emotional pull is. That's what their feeling is. 
Um, but I did get sort of an uh, a view into her emotion and her tie to the place that she was in. Now, I know that doesn't necessarily completely answer Lorna's question, which, by the way, like I said, is one of the best. But um, it it's a very personal thing for me when I connect because I am taking on those feelings and emotions and they are telling me things. Um, and so there was just sort of a little view for me into the other side, probably one of the best views for me into the other side, other than the little girl that I helped to release her from the Herkimer County jail last year. Those are the two big ones for me, but that's just an example of sort of what I, what I've experienced myself personally. So I don't, I don't connect uh, that way at all. So my connection comes from the investigation itself and asking the questions and, and getting the responses. And I think that when you investigate and you're doing the questions and trying to get response, whether it's audible response, whether it's MV, uh, EVP, I was going to say MVP, uh, <laughs> EVP, or it's some sort of work with a, a spirit box or, or you're using a Mel meter or whatever the hell it is. The time it takes, to, it's not like sitting down like we are right now where I can just say, say to you, what's it like? You know, it's it's not like that. What you're trying to do, first of all, is see if you get some sort of connection, any connection. Mm -hmm. And then you try to figure out if the responses you're getting are intelligent energy or if it's residual energy. If it's right. residual, you're not going to get much information anyway. It's just going to whatever happens, happens. Right. But it takes so long just to get to the point where maybe you get a response. Maybe you get a name. Maybe you get a phrase. Maybe you get a hit on a K2 meter that I don't know that I've ever gotten to the point where I've had time in an investigation to go, okay, now I know who this is, or I think I know who it is. I have an inkling. Um, mm -hmm. What's it like being not in your human body? I've never gotten to the point in an investigation where I felt like that question was my next question. But so you know what, though? <clears throat> you know what, though, Todd? When you when next time that we're together, we've already said we're going to be doing some investigating together. That's, you know, um, that's kind of a given. But when we were at Cana Island Lighthouse, I think that would have been a perfect time for us to have been able to do that because it was such a relaxed setting and not just your mom's communication, but the other spirit that we connected with and talked to. That's something that we should maybe make, I, I, you know, a priority next time is because when we get together, our, like you said last week, our, and it just goes to a different level. Yeah. You know, for the two of us, and that doesn't happen all the time. There is a certain kind of chemistry that goes amongst investigators, and some have a little bit more than others, and ours kind of goes to the next level. But that might be something that we should do, that we should explore that, because you are open to that stuff. You maybe don't develop it like I kind of open myself up to develop it, but they are drawn to you. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm, you know, and certainly no denying that. I think just that when I think of a typical um, investigation, I don't think I've ever gotten far enough into an investigation where, because again, we've talked about the fact that we might be experiencing somebody who has passed and it's just their, their energy left behind or visiting right. or whatever, or it could be a, a timeline and we could be, you know, communicating with somebody who's there right now. We don't know. So you know, it's an odd question to go, what's it like to be not in your human body? And maybe they're sitting there going, well, I am in my human body. It's 1823, well, <laughs> you know, I mean, right. Well, you know, that makes me think about last summer when I contacted my friend Trey and I said to him, um, are you OK? And I got like sort of almost in a very Trey like way not a joking, but a heavens, you know what I mean? A answer. And he literally, it literally said heavens. And so it kind of makes me think about that. It's, 
if we were to think to ask, what kind of answer would we get? It's right. just something that most investigators don't think to ask. And would we even understand the answer? Because, <laughs> like, know. you know, who knows what that's like? It may be like nothing to experience on Earth. So they couldn't even equate it. It would be like, so you you ask them, so what's it like being dead? And they go, Horgan, Thurgan, Fergan. And you're like, what does that mean? <laughs> You know, and it's, it's no language. It's no, <laughs> it's, it's no language. Uh, you know, it's a mix between Rose Nyland on the Golden Girls and the Swedish chef on uh, the Muppets show. You know? That was my first thought, too. The but, Swedish chef. But, you know, what I'm saying, like, they may have, there may be, uh, there may be a term for it that we would just not even be able to equate to anything that we, exactly. you know. So it's such an interesting question. And yeah. we could go down 50 rabbit holes, but. I think that's something that maybe we should make a goal is when we are investigating and we hit on an energy that really seems like like I should have said something when I connected with Susan B. Anthony because she was so willing to communicate with me. I mean, so willing to communicate with me. Something like that may have been a question to ask. What where are you now? What is it like for you? Right. So now. And, and this is where my my mind differs. OK, so uh, for uh, for Lorna, who, by the way, is in the UK, um, Susan B. Anthony was I she was like big po- politics woman, you know, all that kind of stuff. Women suffrage. Right. Exactly. And uh, so my <laughs> thought process with Susan B. would be to ask the question, are you pissed that they got rid of your coin? Because back in the day, like in the late 70s, they wanted to honor the first female on an actual piece of currency in this United States. It was a coin. I think it was a dollar coin, Susan B. Anthony dollar. But when they created it, it looked too much like a 25 cent quarter with uh, George Washington on it. Susan B. Anthony and George Washington looking somewhat similar from the side. And so they actually ended up getting rid of the coin. And I, I would ask her. Like, I know. you got a coin, they took it away. How do you feel about that? That that's would be my why, question. That's why our investigative process is so unique. Because <laughs> you're like, <laughs> ooh, what's it like? And I'm like, are you pissed off about the coin? Because <laughs> I'm pissed off way, about the coin. You know, they're still floating around. I know, you can I, still get them, I, but I you can't use not them. not too long ago, but you can't really use them. They're just yeah. kind of like, to, so to look at. <laughs> that would be a good question. <laughs> and how do you feel about looking like George Washington from the side? <laughs> yes, they weren't. Um, she wasn't the most, um, beautiful, yeah, well, beautiful, she, you know, but you know, I mean, she's a rough and tough woman is what she was. She, she was a, she was a lion. Yeah. She was a lion. This woman, she, and, um, her, her best friend, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, which by the way, I would, I would also ask where it was that quotation marks. Uh, yeah. I would ask, is the best friend Brett best friend or was there something a little bit more there? Well, there are Susan. many rumors surrounding of that course. as well. If I, I have to get back to Rochester because I have to go do a Susan B part two type of thing because with, now with we've Todd got all these great questions. With Todd questions. With, with Todd questions, very inappropriate Todd questions. So. But anyways, all right. So that was that was a fun question to try and answer. I don't know. I don't even know if we even got close to answering that question. I don't know either because I didn't I didn't quite understand it, Lorna. But there you go. <laughs> so, okay. So the next question, my cousin Marilyn. This is a great one too. Having to do with empaths, narcissists, and all of that kind of ilk. Why are we currently inundated with videos meant to educate us? Whereas not that long ago, they were unheard of as topics. And, you know, she's right. And we've even discussed this about just the whole paranormal world in general, that up until the last maybe 15 or 20 years, the paranormal wasn't as in vogue as it is today. I mean, you turn on the TV and every time you turn around or you go to Discovery Plus or Prime and there's haunted this and, you know, ghost that. And so there is an awful lot more information out there for people who, I mean, look at the fact that we have our own podcast about empaths, empathicary podcasts. Yeah. There's so much more. And I think that, um, I think that as, as a, I don't know if it's culture as a people, we've sort of started to wake up to that. We've sort of evolved to the fact that these things are not as 
scary or as off limits or as fake as people sometimes used to think that they were, that there might actually be something to this. And so it's sort of evolved because we've talked before about In Search Of being one of the very few TV shows for cryptozoology, the paranormal, anything unusual or strange. Back in the 70s, there wasn't a lot in the 80s. And then all of a sudden in the 2000s, like probably around mid 2000, 2000s, um, Ghost Hunters came in and all these shows started to pop up. And I, I guess it's just maybe, in my opinion, it's just more of a shift. You know, when I was growing up, people thought that psychics and mediums were crackpots and, you know, were fake and were making everything up. And thanks to the, you know, the phone line psychics, it, you know, was ridiculous and fake. Miss Cleo, right? I remember Ms. her. Miss Cleo, Miss Cleo, yes. And I think that as a society, as a culture, as just people in the world in general, you know, we're starting to catch up with that. The Far Eastern nations really grew up with that. The Native Americans really grew up with it. And then we came along and said, oh, this is all bullshit. This is all fake. This is craziness. You know, you're nutty if these things happen to you. And that's why for a long time, I didn't even say anything about being an empath or anything like that. Because my first uh, my first thought is, oh, people are going to think I'm nuts. And I think it's just a little bit more open these days to the idea of that. And I think that even if you're not truly an empath, which a lot of people who think that they're an empath may not actually be an empath. I mean, I know that being an empath is a very serious thing because I live it every day of my life. But it's not just crying in a movie. It's not just loving animals. It's, you know, it's a whole way of life. And I think more people are becoming more in tune with that idea that they could actually truly be empaths. And so it's just, I think, uh, an evolution for me as to why that we hear so much more about it nowadays. So I think there's for for my answer on that, I think there's two things playing into it. I think that when it comes to like paranormal and stuff like that, I really think the show that blew the roof open for everybody was Ghost Hunters, because when we first yes. when we actually saw things happening that made people start to realize, well, there could be. And then all these other shows came out and everything's great now. Um, I think from the woo woo standpoint, I think there's an awakening to this stuff. I think yeah. that there's enough people um, passing along the information that it's being uh, accepted by more and more people. But the other thing is that um, I also think social media is a big part of it. And the reason why I say that is because the stuff you look at on social media will be targeted toward you. So if you look at videos or you see little sayings that are about being em empaths and, you know, the woo woo stuff, you're going to see more and more and more of that kind of stuff. Cause that's the way social media works. Now I, right. I have a secondary question that um, <clears throat> I'm serious about. Like, I know that I'm an empath, but I'm less empathetic to most humans. Yeah. Is that possible? Can you be less, can you be non-empathetic, uh, empathetic and, and be an empath? And I'm just wondering about that because Without truly, a doubt. I, I really do care about people. I just don't want to deal with them because for the most part, it's just not good. Without a doubt. And I tell you this because I think about this a lot and I was just thinking about it recently myself because as a, as a very strong empath, you've dealt with me as a very strong empath. You know what I'm like. Um, as an empath, a lot of people would think sometimes people who don't understand would think that I'm very cold. My own mother has told me before that I'm very cold. And what I think happens is because you are a very strong empath as well. I think what happens is that you sort of shut down. It's not even putting walls up. It's shutting down. It's overload. You know, when um, when you put your phone down on a surface and it sits there too long and, it, and it's an old phone and it heats up and it's going to just die. 
that's sort of what it is to me. It's like you you don't it's not even putting walls up. It's just you shut down. You have to block those emotions to save yourself. It's sort of a um, what's the word defense mechanism? Uh, it's like a defense mechanism, I think, because I get like that. It's just I can only take so much. It's probably the equivalent. I never thought about it like this before, but I'm thinking about it. Split personality. Because it's not the same thing, obviously, completely different things, but it's taking it and really compartmentalizing it to the to the point where you just can't allow yourself to care anymore. And it's not necessarily unhealthy. I think being quote unquote cold has gotten me through a lot in my life because I just, I, once I decide I'm done, then I'm done. And it's almost like an extreme, but it's just the way I am. So I, I totally think that I totally think that that's possible. It's not just putting walls up. I mean, you have walls up, but I try to put walls up. But I think it's different. It's deeper than that. It's just it's not really you haven't lost your ability to be an empath, but you sort of subconsciously picked and chosen what things you allow in and what things you don't or can't. At the beginning of the podcast, we were talking about our friend Kyle, who sent in a, uh, a deep question last week. And, right. and while we're answering this question, I got a Snapchat and it is from him. He's in a coffee shop. Uh, I think they live in Pittsburgh and he says, and he takes a picture, says the art in the coffee shop this month is all aliens and Bigfoot. Ha ha. So there's a great picture of a Bigfoot uh, piece of art on the wall. So I, I would I'm- like to know why Kyle never snaps me. I'm just saying not that I use it that much. I really don't use Snapchat. Well, that's that the much. problem. You're never there. <laughs> never use it. I don't even know how to use it. I don't even know how to add people. You know, I just don't. It used to be called um, peekaboo. That's why there's a oh. ghost for it. And it was literally, it was created to send dirty pictures. It was called peekaboo. And it was, that's why the ghost is the Snapchat chat ghost. Oh my that, yeah. God. I didn't even know that. Oh, that's I did. how bad it, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move yeah, right let's along go ahead. Let's, uh... let's just move right along here. All righty then. Okay. Stephanie, Stephanie G, she has a really good one too. Why do they're all really good? What am I saying? Why do certain people experience unexplained spirit type events while others don't but want to? Does one have to be open to it? Just hope it'll happen. Or do these types of events just seem to occur randomly? Now, I might be having deja vu. We didn't answer that last week. Um, Kind of, sort of. But I think that's why I wanted to lump it in this week, because I think it's good to kind of reiterate that. I think, yeah. You, I think anybody is, is anybody can have an experience. It's to me, it's just a matter of opening yourself up to it safely, opening yourself up to it. You want to be safe about it. And, but anybody can have an experience, but you have to think not so much in terms of just being touched or hearing a voice. You have to realize that experience can be just about anything Mm -hmm. and you have to be open to that, to that possibility. Yeah. I think if we had a similar question or that question last time, I think I reiterated the fact that like I'd been investigating for years and years and never had any experience. And it it took another person with the energy to co co mingle with mine to allow some very crazy fucking shit to happen. And then that's opened it up for me. And the truth of the matter is, you know, like we've even said about us, like uh, if I investigate on my own, I will likely get response and stuff like that. If there's something to respond, if I'm with someone like you, totally different situation. And like you said earlier, different level. right? Right. So I think Part of the issue is um, we want it so badly. Right. And then, yeah, I think there's almost a tightness or a closed off feeling when you're that wanting it to happen. Um, I think there has to be a relaxation, not only in opening yourself up, but in your spirit, in your mental. In your mental place, I, I don't know, there's just kind of this. 
a relaxation that needs to come over you before something will happen. And again, that probably does lend to it itself into, you know, just opening yourself up and relaxing and all that kind of stuff. So find some people that tend to have stuff happen, hang with them for a little bit. And that may happen to you too. That is such a good point. That really is such a good point. And don't go into something expecting. Yeah. Like I've never been, I believe it or not, all the crazy experiences I've ever had and I've had crazy things happen. I have never been touched, but I know that at some point it will happen. I just, I, I try not to even think about it because when you think about it, you want it so bad that either a, you imagine that something happened to you not purposely, but your brain kind of wants it so it happens or you get disappointed. And I just think go into things with an open mind, relax, you know, welcome spirit, welcome the experience if it happens. And if it doesn't say, well, next time it'll happen. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, we sat, we sat last June on Washington Island in front of Nelson's and we were recording an episode together mm-hmm. and I wasn't even expecting this. And it was so funny because I don't think you were either because all of a sudden we both kind of experienced the same thing where we saw in our mind's eye, we could feel and see the native Americans at the tree line across the road. I mean, they were there. They literally were there. We weren't expecting it. We didn't. We sat down to do a podcast. We weren't expecting an experience no. like we were experiencing. And I'll, here it comes. Yeah. You know, and it sort of set the tone for the rest of the visit on the island, because with the other things that we experienced, like in that church thing. Yep. Um, the, the word I can't say uh, the Viking church. It it just sort of tied everything in for us. And it was such a, it was such an interesting thing because we didn't expect to have that particular experience. So don't go in expecting something, I guess you could say, just go in, go in and, and enjoy the fact that you're open to it and that you're welcoming. And the other thing too is, and this, and this isn't exactly what I mean. But kind of fake it till you make it. And what I mean by that is don't make things to be haunted that aren't. Don't think that every bump in the night is a spook. You know, what I mean is if you walk into a place and you get a feeling and you're getting some sort of reaction to it, like you walk into an old building and your mind takes you someplace, go with it. Like, right. understand Like for me, I always used to think, well, that's just my imagination. I'm making things up, you know, because I can I listen, I can do a lot of stuff with my imagination. But then I realized what I was feeling probably was more influenced by what was actually going on there than I realized. So if you walk in some place and you get a feeling. Have some faith that that could definitely be what you're feeling that you are opening up to that that in turn will open things up to you because you're you're starting a communication point that way well two points number 1 one thing that's really helped me is being somewhat of a skeptic anyways i know that sounds crazy but being somewhat of a skeptic sure. myself i don't necessarily think that every single thing that happens is an experience, uh, you know, with with an energy, with a spirit. I don't necessarily, if I can't definitively say this happened, then I write it off and say it, I, I can't say that it for sure was this or it was that. And what that's done for me is that it's given me a discernment so that when things really do happen to me, I kind of understand more that, it really was an experience because I know that I can, you know, I can tell the difference better. So that's one thing that I've done. So for example, I had a candle in my studio fall down twice. Do I think it could possibly have been my friend Trey? Yes, I do. Do I think without a shadow of a doubt, it was my friend Trey? No, I don't. But if it, let's say it happened a third time or something else knocked over, 
then I might be more apt to go with, okay, there's something going on here. It's just sort of teaching yourself the difference between what you want it to be and what it actually Mm -hmm. is. And I think that's important. So um, I forgot my other point, but. (laughs) Good. (laughs) But that's it's just something that's helped me sort of learn how to discern between what's an actual experience and what is not an actual experience. And believe me, it helps. I, um, I can just, I, I, I've learned to turn it on and off sort of as much as I could, but, um, it's just something that you shouldn't go out there hoping for or looking for, let it come to you. And I think that's really important. And I think it'll happen. Because everybody has the ability to have things happen to them. Not everybody has the same level of abilities like Todd has or I might have or or Christina from Apps has. But but everybody has the ability to, to be able to take that in if it happens to you, to experience it. All right. Last set of questions for today. Chris Kohlmeyer, who actually lives in Rochester, New York. And uh, we might actually meet up with Chris at some point when you get out here. She says, two question, two part question. With you and Todd being so close and the discussion on past lives and soul families, in general, when one individual is drawn to another, wh- is that a combination of past life soul group and people vibrating at the same frequency or is it varied to the individual? That's part one. So my take... My thought on Tahad and I is that, well, we've actually been told, I've been told twice now that we are in the same soul family. So basically a soul family from my understanding is there are 12 souls. I think it's 12 souls that reincarnate a lot together. They call it a soul family. You can reincarnate outside of your soul family, but usually it's within the soul family. And each time you reincarnate, you take on a diff- you can take on a different role. So Todd and I may have been father and son in another life or brother and sister or you know uncle and niece or whatever it might be. We could have been best friends. We could have been husband and wife. We could have been wife and wife or husband and husband. We, we you know, but that's the whole idea of a soul family or a soul group. And Uh, these are the idea is that these are consciously made decisions, your consciousness before you reincarnate conscious decisions that you make contracts almost with each other. And that's how you learn and how you develop. So I've been told that Todd and I have reincarnated 28 times, which sounds kind of crazy if you're not informed in the woo woo world. But then when you think about things, you know, um, I never really believed in past lives until maybe three or four years ago when some things happened that made me look back on my life and the way I am today. And it sort of tied me back to uh, a past life of living during the Holocaust, living and dying during the Holocaust. And um, I've actually gotten uh, used my pendulum before and found that Todd, it, it, according to the pendulum, that Todd and I were probably brother and sister during the Holocaust. Um, so I think that when you meet someone from your soul family in each lifetime, there is an instant attraction, not like a not a sexual attraction, but an instant attraction to them. And it's almost like you just know them. Now, Todd and I met in like a really weird way. And oh, he likes to joke and say I stalked him. I didn't really stalk him. I didn't, in all seriousness. Um, he, she did. I did. I did no, not. it was it was a it was a very extreme stalking to the it, point where <laughs> uh, our first fight, I was wondering whether or not I needed to call the cops. So shut up. So I watched his show on Amazon Prime. And for some reason, he's the one I wanted to reach out to. Well, come on, look at me. (laughs) (laughs) And I reached out to him and then I kind of made him be my friend. 
So it was a little bit of a stalking, I guess. But I I did it because I felt like there was this like pull towards each other. And we kind of we had what, like two fights in the be- <laughs> in the beginning, I think. And um, then we kind of calmed down and we kind of figured out what our relationship was going to be. And then that was pretty much it. But there's always been this pull and this understanding between us and this like closeness that is sort it's like like Todd is my family like this this close close brother and sister thing and so I think that in your life in your life today this lifetime that if there are people in your life that you are drawn to that you are pulled towards there could very well be something to it and the interesting thing that i've learned in a little bit of the research that i've done is that it's not necessarily always a, like todd and i are fortunate in that our pull was very positive but there are toxic relationships and the whole point of past lives and reincarnation from what i understand or one of the whole points is that there are lessons to be learned. There are experiences to be had. And each time that you reincarnate, it pushes you up another level so that you become more, you understand more in the grand scheme of things and and what that is. So I always say to people, like, look at the people you're drawn to. And it's also interesting, too, that, like, my husband may not be in my soul group. He most likely is, but he may not be. You know, Dave may have been my brother in a previous. Who knows? And you can reincarnate outside of your soul group. But I always thought that soul groups were a very fascinating, interesting concept, because if you look at your life, there are a lot of people in your life who you are inexplicably, inexplicably drawn to. And you just don't understand why. And so I don't know if I answered your your question, Chris. I know I kind of went off on the tangent, but um, I do believe 150% that Todd and I are in the same soul group and that we, um, I mean, we live states away and we make this work. Uh, you know, it's our... Our partners, like, I mean, we just, everybody is together and it's just, it always works. And so, of course, it goes deeper than that. But that the whole idea is, I do think that when you are drawn to someone, it's a possibility that that person could be a member of your soul group or somebody you've reincarnated with in the past. I don't I don't know how I feel about everything in that in this question. So I really I really can't answer too much to it. I think that there are people in your life that are supposed to be in your life. Mm -hmm. And I think there's people in your life that are there. I was like the uh, is her name Medea um, that Tyler Perry does the old. (laughs) Yes. You know, she always says there's people in your life that are like leaves on a tree They're You know, they're there for the season. There's, you know, then there's the ones that are the limbs and there's the ones that are the roots. Hang on to the ones that are the roots. And and I think that um, everybody plays a part in your life in some way, shape or form. Some are there for long term. Some are not soul tribes and stuff like that. I don't know. You know, I just I don't know. Um Probably, yeah. Probably, we, but I we don't. We can't know for sure. Right. We nobody knows for sure until you're, uh, unless you're ex- going to experience it. Nobody's going to know for sure. Yeah. But you know, it's just the musings and the thought process. And why are you and I so incredibly close? Like you and Lisa. You and Lisa are incredibly, well, incredibly there's, close. Well, here's the reason why Lisa and I are close. Oh, uh, no. Because number one, uh, when she met me, she fell in love. And um, and I'm serious <laughs> that, that really story. happened. I love that story. Oh, I'm, I'm in sorry. love with you. <laughs> can't you see? And then when that finally went away, and I don't know that it never really has, but um, when that went away, <laughs> I'm gonna kill you. then I had a, a friend that I could just merciless, mercilessly um, make fun of to the point of crying because it's so funny. And um, and so then I have to keep her around. Well, you know, 
why would you get rid of that? I mean, that's, you know. Listen, I, you know, it's, it's tough for me. I, and this is, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about today, but on that subject, um, I have a new boss and if, listen, if I'm going to work for you and you want me to be me, you're going to get some shit from me. Okay. Uh -huh. And, um, a couple of weeks ago she was, uh, she was going to do some driving like out of state and it was right around the time of Christmas. And we had all those bad storms, the winter storms. Remember that kind of shut down yes. the country and yeah. stuff. And I said, you're driving. What do you not look at the weather? Roxanne, what's wrong with you is what I said. And of course I'm joking, right? Right. She got offended. <laughs> it was like, she actually said to somebody, I couldn't believe he said that to me. And they're like, <laughs> you don't know Todd then because that was him just giving you shit. Exactly. So if you're if you are going to be anywhere near me, uh, the sarcasm is going to be strong. If, it's going to be flowing. Or if I don't give a shit about you, there will be no sarcasm and I'll be exactly. as serious as can be. Exactly. What was it? If we didn't like you, we wouldn't pick on you. Yeah, that's the whole thing. That's yep. the whole idea. And it's true. You yep. know, so I know I'm I'm. If I I'm constantly you're constantly picking on me and I, I just take it in stride now because, when, you know, it is what it is. So. All right. Last question from Chris. What do you guys find is a good practice to open up meditation, intention, yoga or something more? Um, different different things. Like if I'm just if I want to open up and um, it's not an investigation. I like meditation, but my meditation is not like by the book, transcendental meditation. And you do this and you listen to that and you do these things. My meditation is more, I love to take baths. Water is very, for me, it's very cleansing uh, and sitting in a bath um, allows some of that to kind of go away tension mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. But you know, meditation can be scrolling through <clears throat> YouTube and watching stuff that makes you laugh. Meditation can be, you know, scrolling through social media and finding things that help soothe you and all that kind of stuff. Meditation can be, which I really love getting outside and enjoying, you know, nature and all that kind of stuff. So meditation, I think is really important to help you open up when I'm going into investigation to open up there. I like to go in by myself or with somebody who's like-minded with me. And just go and sit and shut up and feel and experience. I like to do that for like 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Just sit there and get the feel for the location. Let the location's energy get a feel for me. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like you're meeting somebody for the first time. I'm meeting this location maybe for the first time. Allow each other to become comfortable with one another before I go and I go, you know, I've got three flashlights. Make this one turn on. I want you to make this, you know, <laughs> knock for me. If you're not here, blah, blah. You know, I, I don't like those kinds of, of investigations. Right. Sometimes Agreed. you get into that situation, but I really like to go in to get a feel for what's going on and take it from there. I agree. Um, I'm the same way with water. Water for me is freeing. Um, I take baths all the time, too. Um, that I and and I like. I like you're going to now you're going to make fun of me again, but I like fire. So I like candles. I do. So too. Yes. Yeah. When I want to when I want to relax and meditate. And this is, again, non investigation. When I want to relax and meditate, I'll set candles. I when I um, uh, want to manifest something. I have my own personal way of doing it. I think the key there is finding what works for you. What, like you said, Todd, what makes you feel good? What makes you relax? What makes you concentrate and focus? Um, baths for me, I like being outside in the grass in the summertime barefoot. Um, nature for me is huge. So I recharge that way. I ground myself that way. I can just sit there. Sometimes I'll just go sit on the grass and bring the dog out and let him go run around the yard. And I'm just sitting there and listening to the sounds. That to me is like a meditation. So when it comes to investigations, um, my biggest thing is intention. My, I always, once I've set an intention, 
that I'm going to this specific place or I'm going to think about this specific thing, that's when they start coming to me. Um, uh, I've said, I think last week I said that they know when you're open and they'll come to you, they'll seek you. And so they seek me out. They give me names, they give me pictures, they give me movies, they give me um, thoughts, all kinds of things. So setting an intention, I am going to this place, this place. A uh, quick example, many months ago, you went to, was it your cousin's house? Tom? Yes, yes. Yeah, your cousin's house. And you sent me a picture and um, I immediately could like tell that there was a woman on the porch, a female on the porch. And then once to me, that was sort of like setting the intention. And once I set the intention of that was what I was going to think about, a name came to me and I gave the name and you had no idea. Right. And then like the next day or later that day, you came to me and you said, you know, basically like, holy shit. And I said, what? And your cousin's daughter, I think it was, it was that specific name. And was it nobody? Yeah, knew this. something like that. It was yeah. Elizabeth. And I said, well, I said, I'm getting the name Elizabeth, but they call her Lizzie. And I, of course, couldn't tell if that was the woman on the porch. I couldn't tell who it was. I'm not in that spot. And um, sure enough, that was her daughter. That her daughter's name is Elizabeth. And they call her Lizzie. So it's setting the intention. So when you set an intention of where you're going or what you're doing or what you want to find out, a lot of times, if you open yourself up safely, they will come to you if they have a story to tell or they need your help or they want to tell you something, anything. So that's those are the ways that we sort of meditate, relax, open ourselves up to the abilities uh, that we have the possibilities too that we have. So there you go. I want to just uh, reiterate one thing. And that is like, we live in Northern States. I'm in Wisconsin, you're in New York. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times in the winter, it's kind of tough to get out and enjoy yep. nature. I'm not kidding you. When I tell you that watching Bob Ross paint pine trees is about as good for me as going and actually hugging one. And pine yeah. tree, tr for whatever reason, number one, I think I'm allergic to trees and pine trees, but they're my favorite. And I, th I really think watching him create them is just as healing as anything else. So if, well, you, if, if you've not checked out Bob Ross and you want to talk about doing some meditation, sit and watch that shit. I can, I can watch the same episodes over and over, but I usually going to bed at night, I will watch that for a while before I, I go to sleep. I always think that Bob Ross to me is like living, breathing meditation. Yeah. His whole aura, his whole being was like meditative. He was so calm and so peaceful. And so like he would just pull you into that zone. And so, yeah. And, you know, winter is tough on me. So that's why I do love the baths and I love the water and I love that kind of stuff because Winter is just really tough. When we were at Cana Island, what did you do? You hugged a tree. Yeah. You said, hey, I'll be right back. <laughs> and you went and hugged a tree. I mean, you know, nature is a very, very important part of opening up and grounding and, and becoming one with all of that stuff. So. Well, good questions, everybody. Very good questions. Exciting. I love this. So keep bringing your questions to us. And if you're part of our. Uh, Facebook group, Stay Weirdos, Friends of the Sandy and Todd Cast, or you follow our page on Facebook, look for us there, message us there with any questions you have. You can always email us. I think this is a great time for the spiel. You can find the Sandy and Todd Cast on any of the platforms that you normally find your podcasts, including YouTube and Twitter. Be sure to like the Sandy and Todd Cast on Facebook to keep up on the latest goings on, including each week's episode. You can also join our group, Stay Weirdos, Friends of the Sandy and Todd Cast for more fun. Stay Weirdos is a safe place to share your thoughts, feelings, ideas, and random inappropriate memes without judgment. Sandy and Todd also have a podcast called the Empathicary Podcast. It's for empaths by empaths. And if you know an empath, you might want to listen too. Find and like the page on Facebook. 
And finally, if you're thinking about starting your own podcast and just aren't sure where to start, Sandy and Todd can also help with that too. Mind Garden Media is their latest project where the dynamic duo can guide you every step of the way in your podcasting journey. Editing, producing and consulting is what they do. Like Mind Garden Media on Facebook or email them at themindgardenmedia at gmail.com. And as always, thanks for staying weird. So we got some questions left over yet. Is that right? Yeah, we still have some questions left to go. But if you have any more, contact us. If you just listen to us on any of our platforms, you you can find all of our contact info in the show notes. So you can send us your questions as well. I think that would be really super exciting. So we'll just keep going as long as we have questions, Todd. Next week is a brand new month already, rolling into February. That's right. And so Dave always says March 1st is where we've really turned the corner into spring. So let's hope that March 1st gets here really fast. We'll see, I guess. I know. All right, everybody. Thanks for the questions. Until next time. Bye. Bye.